All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Rebecca said, I'm Aaron Moore. I'm with the Agency of Ag, but I'm going to talk about some work that I did in collaboration with uh, Vermont DEC, looking at how we're uh, monitoring reference genes to look at the impacts of climate, of climate change. So I want to start off by saying that streams are very complex ecosystems. So they integrate stressors at local, watershed, regional scales. The biological communities that live there have a lot of intricate interactions with their habitat. But for today's talk, we're really going to uh, focus on two pathways by which climate change can affect these biological communities. The first is through uh, changes in hydrology, which are largely caused by uh, increasing heavy precipitation events. And the other is through increasing water temperature caused by increasing ambient air temperatures. We're going to look at how those affect macroinvertebrate communities. We chose macroinvertebrate communities for a couple reasons. First, the state's been using this group for about 30 to 40 years now as a way to assess stream health. And the second is that macroinvertebrate communities are made up largely of stream insects, which are one of those groups that's going to be really strongly affected by climate change. So we want to look at not only how changes in hydrology and temperature impact the macroinvertebrate communities, but also how this affects our ability uh, to assess stream health using this community, which we normally do based on more local and watershed level uh, impacts. So first, just a little background on how the state uses macroinvertebrates to assess stream health. So these are macroinvertebrates at the bottom here. Uh, those are collected in weightable stream riffles. We bring those back to the lab and ID them. From that community data, uh, we calculate a suite of different metrics those represent different aspects of community structure and function. And then from thresholds in those metrics, we come up with an overall community assessment score. So that ranges from poor to excellent, with anything good or above meeting the state's minimum criteria for a healthy stream, and anything very good or above being at or near a reference condition, kind of a natural condition. And this, so this is an example from Ranch Brook and Stowe. And you'll see that over this, uh, the course of this 10-year period of time, the, the stream met that minimum criteria for that for that reference condition every single one of these years. And we're going to contrast that with the West Branch of Little River, which is also in Stowe, but has some stormwater impact, uh, issues going on. You'll see that several of those metrics fail on an annual basis, and as a result, uh, the community assessment ratings generally, generally fall below that threshold for the, the minimum um, stream health criteria. I also want to point out that during the course of the talk, we're going to focus on four metrics kind of exclusively. The first is density, which is the number of organisms per meter square. Total richness, which is the number of unique taxa. EPT richness, which is the richness of the group's uh, stoneflies, caddisflies, and mayflies, which are species that are generally more sensitive. And then the biotic index. So the biotic index is a, is a score that gives an indication of the community's overall tolerance to disturbance or pollution. So if you're looking at that, a higher number indicates that the community is made up of more tolerant individuals. I also want to point out that, <clears throat> so the state recognizes five different types of weightable streams, and depending on the stream type, there's, we use different, slightly different thresholds in those metrics in our assessments. Uh, for today's talk, we're going to pr focus primarily on the, uh, the small and medium high gradient streams, so those are higher elevation, they have generally smaller drainage area, and of course, uh, fairly high gradient. <coughs> So a little background on Vermont's reference network. Uh, the biomonitoring program monitors somewhere between 120 and 150 sites a year. Of those, 12 are sampled more intensively. Those are our long-term reference sites or our sentinel streams. You'll see that they're, they're really spread out all over the state geographically. All five of our stream types I just talked about are included in that. There's a really broad range of drainage area and elevation included there. But all of them have primarily forest and wetland watersheds, and a lot of those watersheds are protected against future development, either uh, through state or federally owned lands. And then the ones involved here are also part of EPA's regional monitoring network, which is a group of sites up and down the east coast, which are being monitored for uh, similar goals. So what are we doing at these sites? So our primary indicators are the macroinvertebrates, which I talked about. Those are collected during the September to, uh, set the beginning of September through mid-October, that is the index period for that. We're also collecting continuous water temperature throughout the year and stream flow. So a subset of these sites are being gauged either by Vermont DEC or they're co-located with USGS stream gauges. We're also collecting the supplemental monitoring information parameters to help us understand what's going on up there. 
These graphs at the right, just some temperature data I've plotted over the course of 12 months. It's a little hard to see, but if you look at the top graph, you'll see that the, uh, the darker line is one of those smaller high gradient streams. So you'll see that's colder throughout the year than those uh, larger, more moderate gradient streams. I do want to point out that gray box is our, uh, represents that September to mid-October index period. So that's going to, the format of that graph is going to pop up a few times during the talk. This is just plotting some stream flow data from Ranch Brook over the course of five years. Um, that darker line is the most recent year, 2018, the most recent full year. And I did want to note that we also have game cameras out at these sites. So what we're doing there is trying to uh, visually pair those <coughs> flood and flow estimates with those macroinvertebrate habitats where we're actually collecting those samples that allow us to see you know, when they become disconnected, maybe because of drought or when you're getting bed mobility during high flows and that kind of thing. So these sentinel streams, we only have about 10 years of data so far that pairs that macroinvertebrate hydrology and temperature information. It's really going to take a much longer period of record before we start to see some of those really long-term biological responses from climate change. But there are some early uh, results from this hydrology and temperature information that we're using to, to get at what some of these impacts are going to be and how that's going to affect our ability to assess sites. So this graph is is an analysis that's done by a colleague at, at DEC. <clears throat> just shows that indeed the number of heavy precipitation events throughout the state has been on the increase over the last century. So one heavy precipitation event that most folks in Vermont are going to remember pretty clearly is Tropical Storm Irene back in 2011. So this storm dumped about seven inches or more of rain throughout much of the state. The areas that were most heavily affected were a lot of the central and southern Vermont steep sloped areas. So those also happen to coincide with where our small and medium sized reference streams were located. Now, of course, this storm resulted in a loss of an incredible amount of property and infrastructure, as you can see in those pictures. The heavy precipitation did result in extreme flows. So if you look at USGS gauges that are either adjacent to those small and medium reference sites or downstream on the network, Irene was the uh, pretty much the largest, for most all of them, was the largest flow event on the period of record. Tropical storm Irene also coincided with the beginning of that index period that I was talking about for the microvertebrates. So we were out there within days to weeks collecting that data after that storm. So how did the storm affect the macroinvertebrate pages? So I'm going to show you a series of plots up here on the left. These are the metrics. I want to note that that black line is that threshold I was talking about for each metric that puts it at or near that reference condition. Uh, that's going to keep popping up too. So if you look at 2011, when we're out there right after the flood, the densities were dramatically affected. There was a precipitous decline, about 80% loss of density averaged out um, from what we saw before the flood. But I also want to note that those densities pretty much popped right back up in 2012 and were maintained in the years after that. We're going to contrast this with with the richness values. So there was not a statistically significant decline in richness at these sites. So what that tells us is that even though there was a, there was a dramatic loss of organisms, there was not, the flood didn't specifically select uh, for a type of taxa or for any specific taxa. Pretty much some of everything was still left there afterwards. And if we look at those metrics that are also related to that community sensitivity, see the same thing. The, the uh, richness in the biotic index right after the flood was the same as we saw before the flood, the same as we saw in sub subsequent years after the flood. So what effect did this have on assessments, though? We did see that in all seven of those small and medium sites, the assessment levels dropped well below that uh, reference threshold in 2011 compared to the pre-flood. That was largely due to that density metric that I was talking about. Again, those popped right back up in 2012 and were maintained. So what that tells us is that the community seems to be fairly resilient to this single extreme flow event. But of course, then you have to think about what might happen if these events occur with more frequency. And to dive into that, we pulled the data from Ranch Brook. So Ranch Brook actually experienced a series of high flow events between 2010 and 2013, of which Irene was only one. Three of the four highest peak annual flows in the period of record occurred during that four year stretch. And we did see that this resulted in an extended decline in the assessment ratings through that period before they rebounded in 2014 and were uh, kind of steady after that. I do want to point out this is at least partly due to the 
proliferation of uh, tolerant taxa at this site that, that co-occurred with this flood. So if you plot the peak annual flows at Ranch Brook against the percent of the community that's made up of this mayfly taxa beta day, you'll see that they really move up and down in tandem. And this tax, this family is largely made up of the species Betus trigoratus, which is a rapid colonizer on disturbed substrates. It's a generalist feeder, and it's very disturbance tolerant. All right, let's shift gears really quickly. I'm going to talk about the effect of water temperature, increasing water temperature on macrovertebrate communities. So as climate change leads to increasing water temperatures, there's kind of two things that are going to happen to macrovertebrate communities that are predicted. The first is the, just the complete loss of some of those, uh, those more cold water obligate taxa, or at least dramatic changes in the regional distribution based on their thermal tolerances. Loss of these taxa would, of course, have pretty dramatic effects on, on overall stream assessments. The other is through more of a phenological response. So in, insect species have uh, various life stages that are triggered by changes in, changes in temperature. So one theory is that increasing temperatures throughout the year is going to cause some of those summer warm, we warm weather taxa to persist further into the growing season. And of course, we want to know what effect this is going to have on our assessments. So to kind of look at this, we did a seasonal study this year where we went out to five of those medium and small size streams and monitored them uh, on a monthly basis from May until November. So this graph on the bottom is an example from Ranch Brook where I plotted each, each taxa uh, from, those, from, those, from that stream that was present at at least 5% uh, proportional abundance during one of those uh, sampling months. So the colors on these graphs represent the major macroinvertebrate feeding groups. So if you separate these out by color, you'll start to see some seasonal patterns. So at the top, I've got the collector gatherers out there, and those are more of your generalist feeders, and a lot of those are the more tolerant taxa. And you'll see that those really peak during the summertime, and they come down in the fall during those colder weather months. And we contrast this to the uh, more specialist feeders, so those are your algae scrapers, your leaf shredders. Those have fairly low proportional abundance during the summer months, and then increase during those colder weather, colder weather periods. And a lot of those are those EP sensitive EPT tags I was talking about. So what effect did this have on our metrics and assessments? So we saw density increases through August, <coughs> then begins to come down during those winter months. Richness, you see a slight increase in the richness values as you come through the warmer months, that decrease a little bit into the fall. Uh, especially in total richness, so what we think is happening here is that those few tax that are being lost are some of, some of those more, uh, more tolerant individuals. And then biotic index increases during the summer, comes down into the fall, um, so the summertime you're really seeing more of those tolerant species. So what effect did this have on our assessments? If you look during the index period, generally all those uh, assessments are at or above the reference level. Once you get outside of that index period, they're kind of all over the place, but in general they're fairly low uh, and below that threshold. So this isn't surprising given the fact that those thresholds were created based on data that was collected in the fall, but it does show some of the problems that may occur if you start to see some of those summer species um, persist later into the season. A shift here one more time. We're going to talk about the landslide that happened at Cotton Brook that some of you have likely heard about this summer. So Cotton Brook is in Waterbury. It's very close to one of our sentinel sites, Ranch Brook, up in Stowe, and it co-occurred with this seasonal study. So it gives us a really good chance to look at the effects of this landslide uh, in relationship to that uh, reference site. So the landslide, a little background, it's not, the landslide wasn't specifically caused by climate change, but it was believed to have been triggered by heavy precipitation uh, during the springtime, and landslides are one of those phenomena that we expect are going to increase globally with climate change. So it really gives us a good window to look into the effects of water, of water quality effects that these kinds of catastrophic events might have. So about 12 acres was initially lost from the side of that steep valley wall, slid down into Cotton Brook, it was about 250,000 cubic meters of material, of which 100,000 was either deposited in the brook or out in water, the delta to Waterbury Reservoir. So pictures from Ranch Brook and the, and the oh, I lost a little bit of that. Upper Cotton Brook, which is a site above the landslide. You'll see that those, uh, the reference site and the site above the landslide are very similar. To contrast that to what happened at, at, uh, below the landslide, the lower Cotton Brook, you'll see that really heavy set, fine sediment deposition and a lot of that turbidity occurring. See if this works. This is a nine, just a really short video giving you an idea of that turbidity. This is six weeks after the landslide at base flow, so it's been pretty much flowing like that the entire time. 
So what effects does this have on water quality? If we plot the turbidity and total suspended solids, you'll see that they peak in August, they come down through October, and then bump back up in November. What I really want to draw your attention to is the magnitude of those numbers in relation to the background levels we saw at Ranch Brook and then the site above the landslide. Uh, and then the bump up in November, I did want to point out, was co-occurred with a Halloween storm, which is a really significant event in this area. So that hydrograph below is that nearby Ranch Brook with the red stars being our sampling dates, and you'll see that the, uh, the final sampling date that was that really high flow. It really redistributed a lot of the sediment and, and debris that had been settling out of the system. Phosphorus, see the same thing, comes down, really peaks in August, comes down through October, then back up in November. Those numbers are extremely dramatic. Again, I want to point out that this is, this is total phosphorus, so most of that phosphorus is bound to clay particles that are moving through the system and it's not bioavailable. We collected dissolved phosphor in the phosphorus on the final sampling day, saw that it was only about 1% of the total phosphorus number. Iron, same pattern, I know I'm running out of time, so I'll do this stuff. So what effects does this have on the bugs? If we look at Ranch Brook, that dark green line, like we said during the seasonal study, densities increase and come down through the fall. Lower Cotton Brook, the densities were about 35 to 60 times lower than what we saw at the reference site. So we really just obliterated out there before they became a little bit closer in November. Looking at richness at Ranch Brook, the numbers are really high and steady throughout that whole sampling period. The numbers at Lower Cotton Brook were about three to five times lower than the reference site, well below that threshold. And then they bump up a little bit in November. We saw the same thing with Biotic Index. That increases at Ranch Brook, not surprising given the seasonal study, and then back down into the fall. At, at Lower Cotton Brook, those numbers were really high throughout, all the way through October, showing us that those few bugs that were left there were really tolerant to that disturbance, and then it drops down in November. So you may wonder why the water quality got worse in November, but the bug community seems to be a little bit better. What we think happened is that that Halloween storm was so significant that it really washed a lot of those um, bugs from the upper reaches, both from above the landslide down through the system, and they're likely were transient when we were there, and they're probably <laughs> out of the water very good water by now. And then effects on the assessments, Ranch Brook scores at or above that uh, reference level. Lower Cotton Brook gets a poor both times during that index period, showing us that there wasn't any real recovery during that initial six months, but we're going to be monitoring this going forward uh, in subsequent years to track that recovery. So I've got a conclusion slide. I'm just going to leave this here, actually, for people to read and see if I have time for, like, one question or two questions. Yeah, these are a really interesting data, and, and I'm just wondering, how do you correlate these data, in-stream data, with what the condition of the catchment is that's feeding them? Do you do sub-watershed assessments in terms of looking at the condition of the... We are, we are focused basically primarily on, the, on that community condition in there, and we've, the reference streams that were used to create this threshold were picked basically from watersheds that were primarily forested with low nutrient levels and low chloride levels and that kind of thing. So the bio criteria were created based on land use characteristics and that kind of thing. But Just a little bit of a follow-up, but do you, do, you, do you look at the conditions of the road systems and things and some of those oh, watersheds? So on a site-by-site -site basis when we do these assessments, we often do it a lot of times that we'll do that more if a site seems to have something going on, like if it's getting down towards that good level, getting down towards that threshold where you know it's, mo it's kind of moderately changed from reference condition, or if it's failing, of course, then we, then we really take a closer look at what's going on there. You know, nutrients high, a lot of agriculture in the watershed, high road density, chloride levels high, and that kind of thing. Different metrics respond to different of those stressors, like the BI, very reactive to um, nutrient values. That EPT richness, seems to be very reactive to stormwater and chloride and that kind of thing. So the metrics themselves give us a lot of information about what they're doing. One more? You guys have seen any information in the timing for these events? As we think about wetter winters, and that's when you start to see a drop in, in the, the number. If we start to bump up with, you know, that maybe freeze and thaw cycle, and we're seeing some of these bigger events in the winter time. Yeah. Do you correlate any, any change? We haven't really looked at that, so because our because our index period, almost this seasonal study was an kind of a, a unique thing. Most of almost all of our data is from the fall. So changes in like the hydrology during the winter time, a lot of times those may work themselves out by the time you get to the fall season. That's not always true. I mean, like like I said, more frequent 
disturbances, it may really destabilize some of the communities when we see that.